Please rewind this cassette. Hey guys, welcome to Box Office Addict, episode 105. I am your host, Pat, and we'll be looking at the weekend box office and breaking it down and whatnot. Um, the box office continues to be extremely low across the board. This is not a good sign for the studios, and especially the movie theaters, which have been reopening gradually. Some theaters outside of New York and L.A. have been able to reopen. Um, there's been new movies coming out. It's just no movie has opened above the $20 million that Tenet did on its opening weekend, and most movies are opening below $10 million. And it doesn't look like it's possible right now for any film to make any money. Even a low-budget film right now is having a hard time. I was at work the other day, and somebody came up to me and said, there's a new Russell Crowe movie out? And I'm like, yeah, it's been out for like a month. It's just people aren't keeping up with stuff anymore. I am drinking a Great Lakes IPA, a beer that I've become quite fond of. Um, It doesn't taste the best, but... It's like 7% alcohol volume, so it gets you pretty fucked up, and that's what I care about. And like with most craft beers, after you drink like two of them, they taste amazing. You really have to get over that initial, like, what the fuck is this taste? You know, I wasn't an I wasn't an IPA guy for a while, although I do like the cans. They're pretty cool cans. And for a long time, I was a giant neck beard. So naturally, I had to keep up, you know, image whenever I went out to the bar. But, you know, I like Rolling Rock. I like Heineken. I'll drink a Coors Light. I'm not above it. You know, I don't think I'm better than the average man. But, uh, you know, you buy a six-pack of these, and, you know, you drink all six of them, and you feel pretty good. So that's where I'm at. Let's look at the box office. Mostly it's um, re-releases that are out. Like, if you go to the bottom here, you'll see... Yellow Rose, Professor Uncut, Infidel, but then we get The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back on this 2020 re-release hasn't done great. It's done okay. They just re-released Star Wars so many times. It's not like it's a big deal for them. I guess the hype with this was that it's a 4K release from Disney. Now, if it had been the original theatrical version of the movie in 4K, I would have went out opening fucking day. But I mean, I have, I've watched this movie on you know sixty screen, sixty inch televisions. I've seen it in the theater a couple times. I mean, it's great. It's Empire. I think it might be one of the ten greatest films ever made. It's probably the greatest blockbuster ever made, without question. Uh, it had an eighteen million dollar budget in nineteen eighty. Um, originally, I think it made. $540 million worldwide after its re-release in the 90s, obviously. I don't know what it made initially in the 80s, but it was a success. Um, and so far, it's made $2.4 million at the box office. Coco got re-released and made $131,000 this weekend. It's at $210 million, so Coco's not really making an impact. The Kid Detective, what the fuck is this? 140,865 theaters. That is a really bad average. A once celebrated kid detective, now 32, continues to solve the same trivial mysteries between hangovers and bouts of self pity until a naive client brings him his first adult case to find out who brutally murdered her boyfriend. This reminds me of that movie, um, Mystery Team, that Donald Glover was in, where they were the three kids who were like the Scooby-Doo gang when they were young and they solved mysteries and then they get older and they still act like children. So it's almost the exact same premise. And I really like that movie. Love and Monsters. In a monster-infested world, Joel, Dylan O'Brien, learns his girlfriend is just 80 miles away. To make the dangerous journey, Joel discovers his inner hero to be with the girl of his dreams. 387 theaters, 255,000, not bad. I, I've i read about this movie a little bit. I don't know too much about it. Unhinged, here's that Russell Crowe movie. And of course a woman was asking that because women love Russell Crowe. I think it's because he's a man. We don't have a lot of men today, especially in America. So you get like a Russell Crowe, he's like a manly man. And women really like that. Everybody's so feminine today. 
Except the women. $20 million domestic, $39 million worldwide. You know, I have to be honest here. In the era of COVID, with everything going on, this film making $20 million domestic is honestly pretty impressive. Like, this should have made no money. Like, the fact it made this amount of money with everything going on, it makes an argument that if we weren't living in a COVID world, maybe this film would have performed rather well. I'm, I'm actually surprised how well it did. Um... The New Mutants, which I love that they waited for COVID to happen to release this stinker, which they held up for years. Wasn't this supposed to come out in 2016? That's how many years this has been on the shelf. This is like trick or treat. Except that was a good movie. 43 million worldwide. I don't know what the budget is on this thing. I'm sure they spent a lot of money on it. And of course, it didn't work out. Two Hearts. Two of hearts, two hearts, two of hearts, I love you, I love you. For two couples, the future unfolds in different decades, in different places, but a hidden connection will bring them together in a way no one could have ever predicted. Ooh, this sounds interesting. This is in 1,600 theaters and only brought in $522,000. Not a good performance. It's like they're just dumping all these movies they knew would bomb. Now, a film that has been doing well on re-release is Kenny Ortega's Hocus Pocus, which is a movie I absolutely love, and I'm a fan of Kenny Ortega, if you follow this channel. I love Hocus Pocus. I love Newsies. He did the High School Musical movies, and of course he uh, did the Michael Jackson film, This Is It. He was working with Michael on the concerts, but then he ended up making the documentary, which I saw in the theater a couple times. really like Kenny Ortega. Um, everyone knows the story of Hocus Pocus. This film got bad reviews and was a bomb. And then somewhere with video and cable, back when that still meant something, this became a major, major cult film where everybody you know now has seen this movie. I mean, every year I hear people say, oh, I watched Hocus Pocus the other night. I just watched it, I don't know, two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago I watched it and really holds up. I mean, I've seen it in a few years. I've seen it quite a few times, probably like 40 times. But uh, rewatching it, the Zachary Bank stuff is really smart. Just to have the, the tragedy of the, this kid who, who lost his sister Emily stuck in the body of a cat. Although I was laughing at the at the animation of his face. Every time he does something, he's just like, Rrr! he's a little fucking asshole. It's like Rrr! he's like constantly attacking them, and it's. I think they drew over his face with animation to get those shots, but they're bizarre. They've aged really weird. There's some terrific shots. There's some shots with the witches where they're flying that look absolutely stunning. But really, it's just the premise that's funny. It's funny to have witches brought into the modern world, and they're confused about everything. They think a guy in a Satan costume is actually the devil. And Bed Midler is a national treasure. I don't give a fuck what you say. She's amazing in this. Sarah Jessica Parker is sexier than she's ever been in anything, including, you know, uh, what is it? Miami Rhapsody and LA Story. And what's a, God damn, Honeymoon in Vegas. These are all like, like Honeymoon in Vegas, Miami, Rhapsody, LA Story. And then Hocus Pocus. And she kind of steals this movie. I always knew that she was good in it, but when you rewatch it, it's like, holy shit, she is funny. Everything she's doing in the background is really funny. She's good at playing dumb. She could have been on a sitcom playing a dumb character instead of Sex in the City. <laughs> uh, I really like this movie, though. I mean, it's, it's dated in a lot of ways. It's cheesy. It's more of a kid's film. So I'm sure nostalgia is blinding a lot of people in their adulthood for how much they like this movie. But the thing that makes it stand out is that it just is a lot of Halloween movies. There's a lot of horror movies people watch on Halloween. But a Halloween movie, you know, uh, in the same way that there, there's Christmas movies like Elf. This is one of the only ones. And I think that's a reason it stayed on rotation so long. And I think what they they maybe weren't aware of was that Halloween was going to stay so relevant. Where it felt like maybe it would die off. We're in this renaissance of Halloween Particular millennials just seem obsessed with Halloween in adulthood, my generation. So movies like this have just stayed popular. They've stayed in the, the public consciousness, and this is still played. So they release this in theaters, and it's, you know, don't get me wrong, it's only made $3 million, but still, for a movie that was a bomb when it came out, 
and considered it utter failure, you know, a disaster, and critics just like panned it. Here it is making money in there of COVID. I mean, you know, this we made three million dollars. And I, I can't imagine what it's made over the years just off video sales and, and television rights and all that stuff. I'm sure this movie's made over a hundred million dollars for Disney. Um you know, it almost makes you wonder if they should they should go back to the whale on Hocus Pocus. I wouldn't be shocked in a few years if we see a remake of Hocus Pocus. Or maybe they'll do some kind of like television series on Disney Plus or something like that. I would personally like a theme park ride at Disney World that's Hocus Pocus. I think that would be fun. But uh, yeah, the good old movie Hocus Pocus, a holiday classic for a lot of people. Um, but I gotta say, upon recent rewatch, I was surprised it really holds up. It's really fun. And also, Doug Jones is in it, uh, who frequently works with Guillermo del Toro as Billy. The, you know, the release every year of Nightmare Before Christmas. This movie gets released every fucking Halloween, whether or not. I'm not as big on this movie as some other people. I like Nightmare Before Christmas. I'm a fan of Henry Selick. I like Danny Elfman's music. I like the movie. But it's like, everyone I know loves this movie. I almost have a problem with them. All the girls especially I know love this movie. I love the design of it and the special effects of it and the tone of it. But I feel like people just ignore, like, how meandering the plot is and how... Well, I really like the songs. They are sort of half-assed. Like, they're not the lyrics and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't want to shit on this movie because I know a lot of people love it. And it's just that Tim Burton thing. What are you going to do? Uh, but But I like it. I've seen it a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot, because... Everybody fucking loved this movie. Uh, you know, I grew up in the emo era, so everybody was obsessed with this fucking thing. Everybody went to Hot Topic. I can't imagine the money they made off this. This is another one where it did well at the box office. It made like $50 million. And, you know, I remember everyone having this on video, and it got good reviews. But I, I, they had to have made a few hundred million dollars off this movie. There's just no way they have it with the... With the merchandise, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people walking around wearing fucking Jack Skellington stuff, just on backpacks and keychains. I mean, they've had to have made money off this damn movie. Every every girl who has green hair owns something from this movie. I mean, it's just what it is. So there's that element. Um, but they, they started re-releasing this a decade ago, over a decade ago, they started releasing it in 3D. I remember that was a big deal. Like, The Nightmare Before Christmas is going to get this annual release. So this almost just feels pointless because they've been re-releasing this movie so much over the last decade, and so many people watch it. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, once again, I don't dislike Nightmare Before Christmas. I think I've just it's a little overplayed. I think for a while it was sort of an underrated movie and it was cool that everybody was into it and it was it was fun to talk about and stuff. Now it's as popular as anything. I mean, this is a mainstream uh, movie. Surprisingly, I'm shocked they haven't gone back to this as well. You know, Disney likes to milk everything. I'm shocked they haven't tried to do something more with Nightmare Before Christmas because realistically you could go back to that world. They've done stuff in video games. There's a My favorite level in Kingdom Hearts, the first one, is a... Nightmare Before Christmas level. There's a terrible Nightmare Before Christmas game that I remember getting two copies for on Christmas. My sister bought me a copy and my parents got me one and they didn't tell each other that they got me the same game. So I had two copies of the Nightmare Before Christmas game for a little while. And it was fucking awful. Uh, it was really bad. I remember the controls just being utter shit. Uh, uh but I, I do like the message in this movie on some level that Christmas is the holiday that gets all the love. So, which I don't necessarily think is true anymore, but that, that Jack wants the same kind of love and reverence that, that Santa Claus gets. He doesn't want to just be feared, but then he has to learn at the end that people fearing him and what he's able to do is what makes him who he is. But... The fact that the other holidays are sort of overlooked by, by Christmas. So trying to sort of appropriate and take over Christmas, but he doesn't know how to do it properly, 
because he he lives in this world of Halloween and the macabre and all that is a really fun idea. Um, and I actually think if they had spent a little bit more time on that script, it really could be a great, great movie. Um, but Tim Burton <clears throat> has always had an issue with narrative, excluding like Ed Wood. You know, all of his movies sort of have narrative issues. He's not the world's greatest storyteller. So, um, but Henry Selick and his team certainly did. Because for me, like, there's this movie, which still mostly works, and then there's something like Corpse Bride which I know is critically acclaimed and a lot of people love it, but I watched that movie and I'm like, this is the dullest fucking non-movie ever. And that's all Tim Burton. And that's a really bad era of Tim Burton, like, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and stuff, where his movies were still getting really good reviews and they were making money, but I didn't like any of them, except maybe Sweeney Todd. Tenet, $1.6 million. So Tenet's finally crossed $50 million domestic. It'll not make $100 million. I don't think this is going to pass Bad Boys. So Bad Boys for Life is going to be the highest grossing film of the year. That's locked because they've pushed all these other big movies back to 2021. So this is fucking crazy. Bad Boys for Life is going to be the highest grossing movie of the year. This will be the first time in forever maybe since like Men in Black or Independence Day that Will Smith has been in the highest grossing film of the year. The only time that's ever going to happen for Martin Lawrence. Like they're probably at home like happy, like, hey man, we did it, number one. I mean, what's going to come close? That movie made $200 million. This movie's internationally doing better than that film. 283 mil internationally, which honestly isn't that bad considering everything. I actually think... You can make a pretty good argument that if Tenet had come out in a non-COVID world, looking at the numbers, I don't think it would have been like the billion-dollar film people were predicting because definitely the reaction to the film has been mixed, both critically and by audiences. I know a lot of people who just hate this movie. It would have definitely made like $600 million or $700 million easily with these numbers. It, oh, at the lowest, it would have been like six hundred million, I think, because um, it's made three hundred thirty-four million worldwide. Unfortunately, this is a two hundred million dollar movie. What they spent on marketing, I mean, they're not going to break even on this thing for a long time, but they knew that going into it. Um, it's just, it's going to be weird. It's weird in Nolan's career that this movie exists. That it's not one of his better movies. It is one of his more flawed films, and then it came out this year and it performed like this. There's there's so much to say, and yet it sort of just speaks for itself. It sort of is just what it is. But um, Tenet did not bring back the movies. And I is it a victim of its own hype? The War with Grandpa, another shitty Robert De Niro movie, where he plays an old man. He's dirty Grandpa. The War with Grandpa. Dead Grandpa. Mobster Grandpa. And uh, The Irishman. Should have been the name of that movie. This movie opened to $3.6 million last week and has so far made $10 million worldwide. I don't know what the budget is on this. 101 studios. <laughs> All right. Um, God, I'm, I'm already getting a buzz. I'm not going to lie. I've had, a, I've had a couple of these before I started this. I was like, hey, I need to record this uh, box office at it because there's enough movies out now to record one. The reason I haven't been doing them frequently is that they're not releasing new movies. So I'd just be covering the box office for re-releases and Tenet every weekend. So I'm like, okay, it's been a few weeks now. I could talk about some of these new movies. I, maybe I could go back to a live stream format on box office at it for a while since I uh, haven't been doing a lot of content outside of the Halloween Rewinds and the Boys Reviews. Maybe I could give you guys some BOA live stream classic like you motherfuckers want. But I... It just sucks because what made this show fun was the was the, the movie's opening and like, ooh, what's it going to do opening weekend? And all of us predicting it and looking at the, the profit margins and the reception to the movie and second week it drops. And that's all just gone. You know, even with movies coming back slightly like this, 
it's still not what it was. And this has just been really upsetting for me because I used, to, I used to love so much checking the weekend box office on Sunday. That was such a big deal to me. I, I mean, checking Friday to see what the numbers were coming in. And I haven't had that now for such a long time. And it feels like it's not going to come back for, <laughs> I mean, a while. Probably well into next summer before it, it goes back to some kind of normal you know normalcy so uh it's been it's been pretty upsetting um as somebody likes the box office the number one movie this week honest thief another liam neeson action film 3.7 million dollar opening 5.5 million worldwide wanting to lead an honest life a notorious bank robber turns himself in only to be double crossed by two ruthless fbi agents from Open Road Films, Liam Neeson, Honest Thief. Action, crime, drama, thriller. It's quite a bit of genres. Action, crime, drama, thriller. Action, crime, drama, thriller. This movie's 99 minutes. It's PG-13. It was open at 24th in their theaters. And I'm sorry, isn't everyone over the fucking Liam Neeson action thing? Taken was fucking cool when it came out. All those years ago, what the fuck? Wasn't that like 2008 when Taken came out? It's been 10 years. I'm going to say it. I would like to see Liam Neeson be in some dramas again. I'd like to see him be in like, you know, I don't know, a fucking Schindler's List type movie again. Like, it was fun. The Grey and all that. I loved all those movies. Those were all cool movies, you know. But Liam, stop. Okay, you're not fucking Rob Roy anymore. God damn it. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think this movie would open much better even in a COVID world. I think maybe $15 million would have been the opening weekend of this movie without that. Let's see if there's some other ones. We have Alone, the SpongeBob movie Sponge on the Run, Broken Hearts Gallery, She Dies Tomorrow. That's a cool title. She Dies Tomorrow. Henchmen. Bill and Ted Face the Music's made $3.4 million. The Personal History of David Copperfield, a very well-reviewed movie, $1.8 million. No Escape. Um, I know that movie. Yeah. I don't even know what comes out next weekend. The world's so confusing right now. What comes out next weekend? Because they, 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 Mulan didn't come out here. It was on streaming. They pushed back Dune and Wonder Woman and all that. All I keep reading now is this movie pushed back to 2021. This movie pushed back to 2021. This movie. Ridley Scott had a movie coming out this year called The Final Duel, which is weird because his first movie's The Duelist, so I'm wondering if The Final Duel is his last movie. That would be interesting if he's just like, this is the end. I would like if Ridley Scott fucking stopped making movies personally. So I was thinking about Rocky recently and the montages and all of the Rocky movies. And so that's really cool about all the montages is Rocky's body parts getting hit and what he's doing in the punching and all that is like used like an instrument. It's really clever. Like every Rocky movie does this. Like when he's, he's hitting the fucking punching bag or when you guys punch him in the stomach in Rocky 2 because Rocky 2 has two montages. You know, he goes and hangs out with the baby for a minute. Then montage two starts. And it's really, it's really clever. I think it's what gives those the rhythm they have is that the, the sound effects in the gym are, are part of the instruments, so they, they play in with the score. Also, the contrast of images. You know, Sloan's talked about that, the contrast of the, uh, the steps in Philadelphia and him and, and all the sort of things. And the, so there, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on. Visual contrast and then the auditorial, the the sounds, the the physical, the getting hit, connecting with the music and all that stuff, and the gladiatorial nature of the Bill Conti score, you know. But it's so funny in Rocky One, it's just so beautiful when he runs up the steps, you know, and it does the dun 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 dun, you know, and then he gets up there and he freeze frame, and it's like you could see the whole world from up here, you know. Yeah, and it is great. Like you, he's ascended. 
and it's funny in the second montage in Rocky 2, and I love fucking Rocky 2, man. I love Rocky. I think Rocky 2 is like one of the great sequels. I think it's amazing that he made such a good sequel to Rocky. I think that the human moments in Rocky 2 are as good as anything in the Rocky franchise. Like the fight at the end, you know, is like ridiculous. And the fact even as a rematch, you know, with Apollo, but the the meat of that movie, like the, like Rocky, just that, that 85, 90 minutes of it. That's just like, his life is still really shitty after the fight. Like he, he tries to make some money and it doesn't really work out. And, you know, him and Adrian get married and they don't get to enjoy it like they think they should. All that stuff. And he has the kid. I mean, all of it's just so well done and really shows Sly Stallone as the auteur that he was and is, by the way. Uh, but that second montage, it's so funny when he's running and then all these kids show up. Like, where the fuck did all these kids come from? There's like 10,000 children chasing Rocky. Now, it's not that I couldn't believe that some kids would would run with rocky and that's how we could see it in the script like hey we're gonna have a few kids run with me that see me running and they're gonna want to run too that makes sense but sylvester stallone does everything to excess this is the difference between him and john g albertson this is the sly stallone era so he's like no it's got to be like ten thousand kids every kid in philadelphia is running with me and it's 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 amazing there's so many kids and it's like a zombie movie like, you could add a zombie score to that and him running from the kids, and it would look like he's getting chased by zombies. It's horrifying. It's like the opening to the Zack Snyder Dawn of the Dead film. Like, it's just a swarm of child zombies trying to eat the Italian stallion because they want all the meat on his body. He's got all that good, good muscle. Uh, but there's that one part where the kid's like, go, 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 go. God, does that get you pumped up. Just that one, it's like a little redhead fucking kid behind him. Go, go, go. And then Rocky accelerates. There's those moments in the Rocky movies where Rocky accelerates and he becomes the Flash and he goes into super speed and he's like, he's going faster. And the song's like, getting stronger. The music's saying, what's happening? (laughs) It's insane. It's fucking insane. Flying higher. It'd be so great if he just took off the ground and started flying like Superman. He jumped off the ground and he started flying. Flying higher. But, yeah. Love me a good Rocky movie. You know. And they're all good except for like Rocky Five. That's the only one that's not great. It's got the street fight. But all the other Rocky movies are great. But, you know, never trust a guy who doesn't like Rocky. I'll never trust a guy who doesn't like Rocky. All my friends, everyone that I fuck with likes Rocky. But if a guy doesn't like Rocky, I'm suspicious. And my dad didn't like Rocky. You know, he went and saw it in the theater in 1976. He walked out before the final fight. He was like, what the fuck? This movie sucks. He didn't like Rocky. And I don't trust my dad. So shoot you in the game.